means he has to have big things for you to bring it to... that is impossible for God. No, I'm considering he's the one who has given me his word. He's the one who's given me his promises. He's the one that has to bring it to pass. Hey, everybody, it's Pastor Kevin. I want to personally invite you to Accelerate 17. It's going to be held right here at Waterloo Worship Center. These meetings are going to be September 10th through the 15th. Meeting times are Sunday, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., and Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. I'll be speaking along with special guests Larry and Angela Keaton from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and others as the Lord directs. I believe if you're like me that you sense that everything is just speeding up all around us, everything going on, and I believe that the Lord wants the church to speed up on some things. To accelerate means to progress from grade to grade at a faster than normal pace or to move along faster, and I believe that's what the Lord wants to do. The Bible says that we're changed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It could be that maybe you feel like you've been sidelined and you're not in your race any longer, or maybe you've just completely given up and dropped out. Then you especially need to be in these meetings because I believe you will be encouraged, you'll get back on the track, and you're going to finish your course with joy. I look forward to seeing you. I've got some things that I feel like the Lord wants me to share this morning. I had spent a number of hours yesterday preparing and woke up about 3.30 this morning and had some things turned around on the inside of me and, and uh, laid in bed and got up a little before 6 and showered and came down here. And I just feel like he wants me to, uh, to speak these things out and to talk about these things. You know, in the body of Christ, I, I, I'm hearing so many different things. I'm seeing so many different things about uh, about what's taking place, in particular what we see is taking place in uh, Houston, Texas area. As Schaefer mentioned, um, you know, we partnered with Cadence Closet when we did uh, Hope City, when we did Hope Fest uh, at the park here in the city. And uh, Cadence Closet actually went down there. My son Zachary and his wife actually went along with some other team members. And this is their first trip. They're getting ready to go again. They've got a semi-trailer that's being loaded uh, now with supplies uh, over in Cedar Falls that will be going down there in the next trip next week. But um, if you don't follow Cadence Closet, it's K-A-D-E-N-S, Closet with a K, K-L-O-S-E-T, uh, you can see updates on there. And uh, God is moving, and people are responding. And so I've been hearing all these, all these different things, you know, is this judgment is God judging America? Many people are saying God is judging America. And I can't say that I'm not, I can't say that I'm 100% convinced of that. And I'm going to give you some reason why. Why I, I, I'm not 100% beyond that kind of thinking. I believe that sin has entered into the world because of the fall of man. I also believe I'm going to read you something here about the last days. I also believe that what we're seeing is just signs of the last days that were prophesied by the Spirit of God that Paul told young Timothy, his son in the faith, many, many years ago. And he was looking into the future and speaking by the Spirit 2,000 years into the future, into the days in which we live. And so uh, these things should not catch us unaware. We sh they should not catch us off guard. Amen. But what's important is that we as the church, that we're prepared. And most importantly, we need to be prepared spiritually. I believe, in, I believe in doing things in the natural. I believe it's all right to be prepared for things that can happen in our community, to be prepared in the natural, be prepared with supplies, be prepared for whatever. But I believe the most important thing we can do is to be prepared spiritually. 
Amen. Because it's a strong spirit that will sustain a man in his infirmities. A strong spirit will take you things, take you through things that you could never get through on your own. A strong spirit will have you in contact with God and he can lead and guide and direct your path so that you're always in the right place at the right time and you're never in the wrong place at the wrong time. I believe that he's raising up the church and the church is going to be just like the first responders. And when everybody else is running out, the church is rising up and we're running in with the power of God, with the resources from heaven to do what God has placed us here on the earth to do in these last days. Amen? And so let's just look at this for a minute. In Genesis, the 18th chapter, beginning at the 16th verse, I want to read to you, this is in the, in the NLT version, I want to read to you an account of what took place with Abraham and God and the conversation they had concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis 18, the 16th verse says this, Then the men got up from their meal and looked out towards Sodom. As they left, Abraham went with them to send them on their way. Now notice what God said. Should I hide my plan from Abraham, the Lord asked? For Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have singled him out to do so, that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. I think it's interesting we talk about Abraham, but notice God singled Abraham out, and he knew something about Abraham. He knew that he would put in his children the way in which they should walk after the things of God. That was very important to God because he was looking for a covenant keeper. God is always a covenant keeper, but he wanted to find somebody he could make a covenant to it that would remain faithful to God. And not only that, to pass down this, pass down this knowledge of the Lord and his ways to his children and his children's children. So the Lord told Abraham, I have heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant. I am going to see if their actions are as wicked as, as I have heard. If not, I want to know. The other men turned and headed towards Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham. Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? Suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in the city. Will you still sleep it away and not spare it for their sakes? Surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked? Why would you be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same? Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And the Lord replied, If I find 50 righteous people in Sodom, I will spare the entire city for their sake. Then Abraham spoke again, Since I have begun, let me speak further to my Lord, even though I am but dust and ashes. Suppose there are only 45 righteous people rather than 50. Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five? And the Lord said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 righteous people there. Then Abraham pressed his request further. Suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of 40. Please don't be angry, my Lord, Abraham pleaded. Let me speak. Suppose only 30 righteous people are found. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it if I find 30. Then Abraham said, since I have dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. Suppose there are only 20. And the Lord replied, then I will not destroy it for the sake of the 20. Finally, Abraham said, Lord, please don't be angry with me if I speak one more time. Suppose only 10 are found there. And the Lord replied, then I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. When the Lord had finished his conversation with Abraham, he went on his way and Abraham returned to his tent. I think that's interesting because you see a picture of the heart of God. That he does not want to destroy the righteous with the wicked. You also see the heart of Abraham. Abraham's heart was God. If there's any righteous in this city, don't destroy them. We could say he was an intercessor, so to speak. He was going to God on the behalf of perhaps there's people there, Lord, that shouldn't be destroyed because they're not evil, they're righteous. And according to the word of God, God couldn't even find ten. I believe that if Abraham would have said, Lord, if there's one, will you save it for the one? I believe that the Lord would have done it. He's a loving God. And you have to understand, notice what it says that caught his attention. He heard the cry of sin. Sin cries out. There, I promise you that if you were in heaven at the throne of God, there is sin that cries out from our nation and all around the world that sin has a cry to it. Yeah. 
But God still has a heart for people. God loves mankind. God had a plan for mankind. And he saw how it got messed up in the garden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sin entered in. But let's go here further. We were talking about, I, I, I've heard these different things about the destruction that's coming, that cities are being judged by this destruction, and then they, people want to point to certain things, you know, of why, and I've heard things like, uh, 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 like Katrina. When Katrina hit, I heard a lot of people say this was the judgment of God, but then I started asking myself, if this was the judgment of God, then why is Bourbon Street still intact? Why did the judgment of God miss on, out on some of the evil and yet the righteous were wiped out? Do you know that after Katrina hit, over 200 and some Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches never opened their doors again? Do you think God would do that? Do you think that would be God's plan to do that, to wipe out the righteous? When you look at what's happening in Houston, and you know, we've, I've, I've heard these different things. I remember it was a year, year and a half ago that the mayor had come out, and uh, the, the mayor is, 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 uh, is, is gay. And, and at the time, and, and the mayor was basically asking the pastors, they were trying to pass this anti-discrimination uh, thing, and they were asking the, paper, the pastors, she was trying to get a court subpoena that the pastors would have to bring in their messages that they are preaching from the pulpit. Boy, I wish I would have got, I wish I lived there and got subpoenaed. She would have loved my message. <laughs> Amen. It would have been the word of God and I would have told her how she could be saved. And so, and so, and, 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 and so you had this come from. And then they had the largest gay parade. 700,000 people were in Houston for this gay parade. So people are saying, this is all the judgment of God that's being poured out for what is going on. But was there not any righteous in Houston? Is there not righteous people in Houston? I know my son and his, his wife and the team, they're set up in a church parking lot right now. And in and, and this, you saw this in New Orleans, some of the ground zero places when this took place were churches that were opening up their doors and bringing in aid and bringing in supplies and showing the love of God. Let's go here a little bit further. Let's look at this part about God. Let's see another example in Exodus 12, the third verse. It says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two posts and on the upper doorposts of the houses wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast and fire, unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water, but roast with fire, his head and his legs, and with the pertinence thereof, that remaineth thereof. And you shall not let any of it remain until morning." And thus you shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now notice this. This is talking about the children of Israel who had been held captivity in Egypt. Now let me just say this. Egypt is a type of the world. It's a type of a world system. It's a picture of the world. The promised land is a picture of the new birth. Amen. Pharaoh is a type. He's a picture of the devil. And yet he had had God's people in captivity, and the Lord said, you're going out now. I'm leading you out. Do you know all the different things that had taken place before him? But he gave them instruction concerning a lamb, and it needed to be a lamb without blemish. That lamb without blemish is a picture, if you would, or a type of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the spotless lamb who was, flain, who was slain from the foundation of the world. Aren't you glad that God had a plan? And then he said this. He said, I want you to do something. Let's read this. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood... I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. 
And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread, and even the first day you shall put away the leaven out of your house. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and the seventh day there shall be a holy conviction or convocation, no manner of work shall be done in them. Save that, the feast of the unleavened bread, for the selfsame day. Have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt? Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by the ordinance forever. And the first month of the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days there shall be no unleavened bread found in your houses. Now look at the 21st verse. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the intel or the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass by through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the, in, the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not, now notice this, will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Now that is a picture of the blood of Jesus. He said, you take this blood from this spotless lamb. He said, and you, 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 you put it on a high sop, and you put it around your lentils and your doorposts. And guess what? When the destroyer is passing by, when he sees the blood of Jesus, he's going to just have to keep walking. You know, people don't talk about this much like they used to back in the day. But back in the day, people had a lot more. They made much more ado about the blood of Jesus. And they would plead the blood of Jesus. Mary and I, we plead the blood of Jesus. We get in our vehicle to go down the road. We plead the blood of Jesus. When we're going out of town, we plead the blood of Jesus over you, over our church, over our home, over our children, over our grandchildren, over our families, over our resources. We plead the blood of Jesus. Because when the enemy sees the blood, glory to God, he's got to pass on by. Notice he said, I will not allow the destroyer to come and to destroy you. Aren't you glad for the blood of Jesus? We should apply the blood of Jesus. I know our children just started going back to school. You ought to be applying the blood of Jesus every day when they leave the house. I plead the blood of Jesus over you, young one. Amen. There's no weapon that's formed against you that is going to prosper. Now, Mark, the fourth chapter. We see this where Jesus was on the boat in the 35th verse. He was on his boat and he was getting ready to cross over to the other side. Do you remember this? He said, let us go to the other side. And of course, they're on the way over to the other side. And on this journey over there, a storm came up. It was a windstorm. The, uh, the, if, if you were to Greek it out, it's called a Eurocliden. This is like hurricane force weather storm that arose when Jesus and his disciples were going on over to the other side. Now think of this. Jesus, who was the word, who became flesh, gave the word... Let us go over to the other side. And so they're on their way over to the other side, and Jesus is down in the hinder part of the boat, and he's taking a nap. Remember this? And so Jesus is down there sleeping. Here comes the storm, very, very violent storm, and all of a sudden his disciples go down, and they talk to Jesus, and they wake him up, and they say, Jesus, don't you care about us? Don't you care that we're perishing? And so Jesus got up, and now notice what Jesus did. Jesus got up, he got on the boat, and he rebuked the wind and the waves. Now, let me just ask you a question. If Jesus was God in the flesh, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, if Jesus was God in the flesh, then would he have the authority given by God to rebuke the wind if God sent the wind? No, he'd be going against God. Jesus said, I never do anything unless I see my father do it. I never say anything unless I've heard my father say it. Jesus was acting out exactly what he was supposed to do. He rebuked the winds and the waves. So that tells me it was not God that sent the wind and the waves and the storm that could catch their life. It didn't come from God. You might say, well, where do you believe it came from? Well, I believe if you continue down as soon as they got to the other side when Jesus rebuked the storm... He also rebuked his disciples for not rebuking the storm. That means when you have a storm in your life, you need to rebuke it. 
You need to stand up and use the authority that God has given you and say, in the name of Jesus, you stop. And this is even in natural storms. I remember years ago, my dad was on oxygen and we needed to have electricity. And there was a storm and it was coming. And nowadays, thank God, you can turn on the TV and watch the radar and you can watch the storm come in. And I remember my mom was there, I was there, and we started rebuking this line. It was all orange and red, and it's coming right over Waterloo. Remember this? We started rebuking that storm, and the storm went like this. It spread apart, went right around Waterloo, and came back together. You said, that's just a pipe dream. No, it's not. That's authority. Do you remember what Chip Brim shared in, 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 when he was living in Branson several years ago, and they had something that never happens in Branson? They had a tornado. And he's, here comes a tornado bearing down on his neighborhood. And this tornado's coming right towards him. And he goes out in the front yard and he starts rebuking that tornado. He's saying, in the name of Jesus, you can't destroy. Who is it that comes to kill, steal, and destroy? Is it God? No, it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So he's out there and he's rebuking the storm and he actually said this, and I mean not even one shingle's coming off my roof. Actual fact, you can go back, you can probably Google this and YouTube it. News came and interviewed him. Houses all around him devastated. Devastated, leveled. And here is his house standing, the only house standing in that area. Not one shingle got blown off his roof. Tell me this stuff isn't real. Now, if God sent that storm to wipe them out, come, come on now. If God sent that storm to wipe them out, would he be in a place that he could exercise authority against the storm? He'd be going against the will of God if he did that. See, this is what I'm saying. This is why we need to, we need to think through some of these things about how we just jump on every bandwagon that we see coming down the pike. Amen. Let's stick with God and let's stick with his word. I believe that when Jesus, when he rebuked that wind and the wave, I believe here was the source of the storm. As soon as they got to the other side, there was this man who was demon possessed. And the Bible said we call him legion. And that man came and he met Jesus when he got off the boat. I'm just wondering, I mean, I'm just thinking, could it be that the enemy knew that Jesus was on the way? And that everything was going to be all right for that man who was possessed with over 50,000 demons, had an unclean spirit, and he was set free. He was clothed and in his right mind. And everybody came around and looked at the sign and wonder because Jesus had set him free. You see, sometimes when you're going through a storm, it's just because you're out on that river, you're out on that lake, but what you got to realize, there's a storm, and it's because of what's going to happen when you get out the boat and put your foot on the shore. Amen? Every night, listen, God is God, and he's sovereign. But listen to this part. You have to understand this. You hear this often if you come here. It's such a, a foundational truth that we have to build into our lives. And that is this, that Satan is God of this world. If God was running things down here on earth, man, I would sure hate to go to heaven. Because it would be in a big mess. God's not running things down here on earth. Satan is the God of this world, but his time is coming up quickly. That's why there's an increase, and you're going to see an increase. I'll read some things to you. But that's why you're going to see an increase more and more. You're going to see increase in weather things, earthquakes, famines. The Bible says it. You're going to see an increase in demonic activity. The Bible says it. Amen. But the church is going to be in a place. Glory to God. The church is going to be that city set on a hill. That church is going to be that light that is in darkness that dispels the darkness. The church is going to be a place where people can come and get help and comfort and deliverance and provision and help in every way. Thank God. Let's go here a little bit further. There's a curse on the earth and it's because of Adam and Eve, they started it. People say, man, I wish Adam and Eve wouldn't have missed it. Well, I'd, I'd like to see how you would have done. Amen? But they started this. 
God gave them dominion. He gave them authority. Isn't that right? He said he blessed whatever they put their hand to. Adam messed up. Adam shouldn't have ever left that serpent in the garden like that. Amen. And Eve shouldn't have entertained it and shouldn't have fell for it. And then she shouldn't have been able to talk Adam into falling for the same thing. And, of course, human nature, he gets caught and he blamed his wife. Some of you men are still doing that. Some of you women are doing that to your husbands. It's blame shifting. We like to do that. It came with the fall. It's not my fault. Not my fault, Lord. No, not my fault. It's them. It's the wife you gave me. It's my parents. It's my upbringing. It's whatever. That's, that's, that's not my fault. Amen. No, we're all, held, we're all held accountable. And so you see this in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. I'm just going to read you a few verses here. And I'm going to start in the 15th chapter. It says, but it shall, or the 28th chapter, 15th verse, but it shall come to pass... If you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Now, these are curses I'm going to talk about. Because I hear Christians call what God calls curses blessings. Let me say that again. I've heard Christians call what God calls a curse blessings. I was so blessed... When I was sick, God taught me so much. God didn't say that's a blessing. Let's look here. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send you cursing, confusion, and rebuke, and all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed, and until you perish quickly, because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning fever, and with the sword, with scorching, and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish. That's all a cursing right there. Now, when it says that the, Lord will curse, that the Lord will actually do it, you have to go back and look at the Hebrew. It doesn't say that the Lord will actually do it. It says that the Lord will permit it. We love to pray that prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many people believe that when you get to heaven, it's full of curses? How many believe when you get to heaven, there's sickness, there's poverty, there's famine, there's disease? None of us believe that. But yet... This is what he's talking about, this cursing. But why did it start? Why did this cursing come? What allowed it? He said, you disobeyed my words. You disobeyed me. Let's look at the blessing. I want to end up on the right side here. First verse of, 20, of the 20th chapter. Now it shall come to pass, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. How many like this? Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, and the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face. They will come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all that you set your hand to, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. That's a blessing right there. Now notice this. So we look at this curse, the curse of sin. And we can't not talk about Galatians 3.13. I hear a lot of people, they, they ask me about this. I've heard people, you know, different people talk about it. And a lot of people talk about curses that are in their family. Generational curses that have been passed down from generation to generation. And let me just say this. Galatians 3.13 says Christ has redeemed you from the curse of the law. And I think instead of going and in, 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 in arguing points about if your family has a curse, I think one thing very often, it might not even necessarily be a curse. It's an environment in which people are raised up in. 
and that's all they know, and they act like their mom and dad, and if you don't think that's true, wait till you're a parent. You'll say things, you'll say, gosh, did I really say that? That sounded just like my dad. That sounded just like my mom, and then you get this revelation, I've become my dad. <laughs> things, I'll, I remember, I'll never say that to my child. I'll never be like that, and then you're just like doing that. Amen? So, so anyway, if Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for cursed is he who hangs on the tree. That means he went to Calvary for us. He took our sin. He took the curse. So that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through faith, right? So if God, if, if we've been redeemed from the curse, then we have to believe it. So that tells me that even if there was a generational curse, and let's say it came down through my family lineage, guess what? I got saved. That curse, that, that curse, that curse no longer has the power in Jesus' name. I have been redeemed from that, from that generation on. It can stop in the name of Jesus. One other scripture just to ponder in the Old Testament, it says the curse won't come causeless. Meaning there has to be a cause. There's a cause when the curse does come. And it's sin related. Let me just tell you that much right there. Let's go here a little bit further. So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. Aren't you glad? That means he took our place. That means we deserve the curse. That means we deserve the punishment. That means that we deserve the poverty. That means that we deserve the lack. That means that we deserve the sickness. But Christ redeemed us from every single one of them. He took our place. He became our substitute. Aren't you glad? You remember when you had a substitute teacher in school? Man, them days were rough for the substitutes lots of times. Every kid wanted to push it and see, you know, this is a new teacher. But you had a substitute that took your place. Think of that. God so loved us that he knew we deserved the punishment of our sin and our failing and our shortcomings. But yet he sent a substitute. His name is Jesus, and he said, I'll gladly take it. I'll take your place. I'll take the curse. I'll take the punishment. I'll take the sickness. I'll take the poverty so that you don't have to take it. That's how much God loved you. That's why you hear me say very often that I'm dogmatic, that God will never put anything on a Christian that Christ redeemed us from. God would never, God doesn't get in cahoots with the devil. Oh, I know, I just heard Job. People want to talk about poor Job. You've got to realize Job, Job had to open the door for the Satan to come and attack him. God used to point him out. He said, look at Job. There's no one else like him. He is an outstanding person. He loves me. He knows my ways. He follows me. And Satan had to come and he had to accuse in front of God. He had to find something he could accuse Job about. Think of this in your own life. The enemy is the accuser of the brethren. He is looking that, to, to bring accusations against every one of you. He wants to accuse you, and he wants to accuse you before God. We love that Psalms, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, my God, he's my deliverer, and him will I trust. A thousand may fall at my side, ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come nigh my dwelling. Only with my eyes shall I behold to see the reward of the, of the, of the, of the wicked. But what if you miss the first part of the verse? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High and is abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. If you're getting out from underneath God, if you're not staying tight, if you're not hanging tight with God, guess what? You're no longer under His protection. He didn't do it. You did it. Amen? So here, we, so, so here he's accusing Job. And finally he found a reason that he could go and he could attack Job couple side notes. I believe that what opened the door for Satan to come and attack his life is that Job said this with his very mouth, that which I have feared has come upon me. The enemy, one of the reasons he loves to bring fear into people's lives is because that opens the door. Fear is a great opening for the enemy in our life. Whether it's fear of sickness, whether it's fear of death, whether it's, whether it's fear of loss, whether it's fear of destruction, whether it's fear of an accident, whenever you start operating in fear, you are beginning to open your mind and your heart 
to the enemy. And this is where it starts. Fear starts here. You're opening the door for the enemy when you do that. And he began, he said, that which I feared came upon me. He must have feared losing his family. He must have feared losing his stuff. Amen. Must have feared losing his wife. He must have feared uh, people dying. He must have feared all these things. And then the enemy opened it up. But the, read the last of the book. God restored back to him. And then some everything that he had lost. He stood strong. He would not curse his God. Even though his wife was telling him, you ought to just give up on God. Man, that sounds like the enemy, doesn't it? Get you to give up on God. Say, I'm never giving up on God. So let me read this to you. This is out of Rick Renner, Sparkling Gems from the Greek. This is his first volume. He has a volume number two. I don't know if we have any ones left out there. I know we got some twos. But it's, it's, uh, it's a daily devotional, but honestly, I don't use it as a daily devotional. He's got a concordance in the back. So I can go in the back and I can find everywhere that he used certain words and then look it up in his thing. Well, he's our modern day Strong's. You ever heard of a Strong's Concordance? Strong was a, was a, in, or a Vines. They were great scholars of Greek. And, 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 and so Rick Renner, I believe, is a modern day Greek uh, translator, a guy who understands the Greek language probably better than anybody else alive on the planet. It would not surprise me. And so this is what he writes about perilous days, using the scripture 2 Timothy, the third chapter. It says, but know this also, that in the last days perilous times will come. Now notice this, he's talking about a certain time, the last days. Now I'm going to read his commentary. The Bible makes it unmistakably plain that in the last days the world will be filled with difficulties, the like of which have never before been known in the history of mankind. In fact, the Holy Spirit was so committed to making sure we understood what will occur in the last days that in 2 Timothy 3, 1, it is as if he points his prophetic finger 2,000 years into the future and specifically foretells what will occur at the end of age. I really believe this is, this is why it's, it, everything's speeding up. Everything's accelerating. I can't tell you how fast, like this summer, come on. Labor Day? Everything is speeding up. Technology, communication, everything is speeding up, accelerating. And I really believe part of it is because we're coming to the end of one age. And that age is the church age. I don't know how much longer the church is going to be here. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe we're at the end of the ages and we're starting to overlap, overlap the next age where there's going to be the battle of Armageddon. The Antichrist is going to be revealed. He's going to set himself up on the throne as if he is God. He's going to say that he is God. He's going to have lying signs and wonders. There's going to, the people who are here are going to have to take the mark. They won't be able to buy or sell. Nowadays, that's possible because you just go everything electronic. And if you don't have... If you don't have an electronic strip or whatever, you can't. I mean, Walmart could shut you off if they said we're not taking cash or checks. If you didn't have a debit or credit card. Electronic, I'm just saying. And so you see all these things. The, the stage is being set. I believe that with everything in me. And that's why I believe in the world. I'll finish this in a minute. It's going to get darker and darker, but the church is going to get brighter and brighter. The church is going to get lighter and lighter. Dispelling the darkness. Let's look at here further. This know, this word know is the Greek word uh, gnoska, the Greek word for knowledge. But in this verse, it is used in the present imperative tense, which means it is a strong command to recognize that there is something that must be known, must be recognized, and must be acknowledged. Having this knowledge is not optional, it's mandatory. The verse continues, this know also that in the last days. The word last in this verse is from the word uh, estos, which points to the ultimate end of a thing such as the last month of the year, the last week of the month, the last day of the week, or the very extreme end of the age. In other words, the word eskosis doesn't merely describe the last days in general, but the very last of the last days. It was used in classical Greek literature to depict a place furthest away, such as the very ends of the earth. In this sense, it also signifies something that is final. With this word extosis, the Holy Spirit through Paul takes us right into the end of the age to enlighten our eyes and help us see what the world environment will be like 
in the concluding moments of the age. Paul goes on to say that perilous times will mark the final age. Perilous is the Greek word chapolis, a word used to describe ugly words that when spoken are hurtfully are hurtful and emotionally hard to bear. It is also used in very pieces, various pieces of literature to depict wild, vicious, uncontrollable animals that are unpredictable and dangerous. It also carries the idea of action, place, person, or thing that is harsh, harmful, and filled with high risk. This is the very word used in Matthew 8:28 to portray the two demon-possessed men who were so legendary in the country of the Gadarenes. It says, and when he was come to the other side into the country, the gatherings, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. The words exceeding, exceeding fierce is the same word, chapolis. This meant that the two demon-possessed men were like wild, vicious, and uncontrollable animals, and completely unpredictable and dangerous. Simply being in the region near these men placed one's life in jeopardy, because these demonized men were chap chapolis, uh, harsh and harmful, presenting a high risk to anyone in the region. Taking the definitions of all these words in consideration, we can say it this way. You em emphatically must know what am I about to tell you. In the very last part of the last days, in the very end of the age, hurtful, harmful, dangerous, unpredictable, uncontrollable, high-risk periods of time will come. Considering the events that have shaken the world in recent years, we shouldn't be shocked to hear that this is the meaning of 2 Timothy 3.1. Dangerous, harmful, high-risk periods of time have already arrived. We are living in a generation that faces world threats no other generation has ever known. As always, the Holy Spirit was correct in what He was trying to tell us. But why did the Holy Spirit forewarn us about these events? Were His prophetic warnings intended to scare or to fill us with fear? No, the Holy Spirit, as always, as He's always done, wanted to prepare God's people so they could be spiritually alert and ready to minister to people who suffer harm as a result of the events that will grip the world at the end of the age. See, what's He trying to do? Where does He want the church? He wants us in a place that we are in a place that we can minister to a world that is hurting. Romans 8, 19 through 22 says this. And I'm going to read this scripture because, uh, you know, we're talking about some natural things that have happened. Natural phenomenon, for lack of a better word. The earthquakes, um, hurricanes, uh, weather swings, temperatures, flooding, all these things that we're seeing happening. But have you ever thought about this in Romans the 8th chapter? It says, for all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Now, who did he say is waiting? All creation. Now, what is all creation? It, it includes people. It includes animals. It includes mountains. It includes waters, oceans. It includes all things that have been created by God, it includes every one of those things. Now think of this, all creation is waiting. What are they waiting for? For the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against this will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know, say we know, yeah. that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Could it be that what we're seeing is creation groaning? And creation travailing. And what are they crying out for? They're crying out for you. Yeah. They're crying out for me. They're crying out for those who are born again. He's crying out for God's children, God's sons, God's daughters to be made manifest on the earth. What does that mean? To be made known on the earth. Glory to God. For us to come forth and to manifest God's presence everywhere. I believe that's what's going on. I believe the earth is travailing and the earth is groaning and it's looking for the manifestations of God's children. And let me just say this. We are seeing the manifestation of God's children. 
Even in the midst of tragedy, we are seeing the manifestation of God's children. They are showing up in droves. They're showing up. You know, there's a, 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 the, the, the world has been, and especially recently, all the hate. Everybody's hating. That's one thing I don't like about social media is people feel free to freely hate. You know, it's easy to freely hate on somebody. You know, they don't even know you. And you live, you know, 1,500 miles away. You got all these haters out there and everybody's hating. And then we've got all these tensions rising up in, in, in our nation, you know, uh, Antifa. And I mean, all these different groups that are, you know, fighting this and fighting that. And there's just all this hate and all this stress and all this strife. But in the very midst of it, there's something happening where God's love is being shed abroad and being poured out on a bunch of hurting people. Yes. Bunches of hurting people. I mean, uh, Mary's sister and brother-in-law live in Spring, Texas. And where they lived in their house, they weren't affected so much by flooding. But, I mean, their city and the different areas around the roads and stuff like that. And um, they went and got her dad out of a, out of a nursing home and evacuated them. And, because the nursing home was going to go to this hotel. And then later on in the news, they see this hotel. I think, what is he, 90 years old? They see this hotel surrounded with water. I mean, just, uh, uh, just things like that. But then in, 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 their, in, in spring, they gave out this word. Somebody on the local news said, that, you know, that our, our first responders, they've been out. They've been out for hours. And things like we don't think about, like, uh, I need to have gasoline for my boat. And it's not like you're going to go to the BP or whatever and fill up with gas. There's, in fact, Zach and Katie, when he called me yesterday morning, they were kind of having a little crisis because they were having a hard time finding gasoline to continue their journey down to, uh, to Houston. And so you think, so they gave this call, and there was just an outpouring. These, they said, these guys are hungry, they're thirsty. And all of a sudden, here comes all these people, and they're showing up with their tanks of gas, you know, or whatever, to help these guys and bring them food. It was the love of God being made manifest. There was this one guy, uh, 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 Mary's brother-in-law shared this guy, and, 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 and this reporter got on the boat with him. She went as far as she could, her and her team, and so they said, come on the boat. And they're out there, and she's like, why are you doing this? He's from Kentucky. He's just, you know, he's a good old boy. The way he's talking, you know, he's real, real Southern. And he said, I just, he, 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 he said, I just, I feel like the Lord told me that I'm supposed to pack up my boat. He said, they're making a lot of these other boats get off because the current's so swift, and they got these little motors. He goes, you know, we got big bass boats in Kentucky. He did. He had look look like about a 200 horsepower on the back. He said, he said, so I'm just, whatever I can do, he said, I, I, I'm just here. I feel like the Lord told me to come. Amen. And she's like, are, are you serious? He goes, yeah. And she goes, well, you're a pastor. He said, well, I used to pastor. He said, now I'm an evangelist. But he says, I love God, and God loves me, and God loves these people, basically, is what he's saying. And God wants some help. So, 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 so that's why I'm here. You just see that. I mean, time and time again, uh, the, 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 some of the posts I've seen from Caden's Closet, I mean, they can't even hardly get through the post because they're just sitting there crying because of the outpouring of not only the outpouring of love that they are showing the folks there in Houston, but the outlove of the people in Houston and that are coming forth and saying, you're from Iowa. I can't believe that you would do this. And then I got to get the details on this one, but some people came that, that, that couldn't even speak English. And yet they were able to, able to, uh, to, to help the people with some, with some supplies. and some, I mean, in the midst of this, the love of God is being made manifest. The sons and the daughters of God are being made manifest in the earth all around us. Now, you're not going to see a lot of stuff on the, on the regular news is what I'm saying. They still want to talk about all the other stuff. But I'm telling you, this is happening hand over foot and hand over foot. We saw a video of, of, of tractor truck trailers lined up. I don't know how many there was, just a long line, and they're just waiting for the waters to go down because we got to get in there. We've got to get in there. See, I believe that's just a, that's just, a, the, the, the church, this is what Schaefer was saying at offering. I mean, it's my heart. See, this is what the church needs to be in a position to do. People say, well, you know, you just, want, you just want money so you can drive nicer and live bigger or whatever. No, 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 no. The kingdom of God needs money so that we go in there and we don't have to wait on American Red Cross. Thank God for them. We don't got to wait for FEMA, who it might be days before they get there. 
But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are in a place. I mean, wouldn't you love to just own some semis and tractor trailers? I mean, you just, hey, you know what, you're laughing, but we're... I'm not prophesying doom and gloom, but we are going to see more of this in the last days. I'm just telling you. And why not have the church in a position that the church is, I mean, the tanks are gassed up. I mean, the stuff is loaded. We're ready to, we're ready to, you know, we're ready to roll. We got teams that are saying, I'm going, and this is why I'm going. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to show Jesus. I'm going to be his hands. I'm going to be his feet. I'm going to show them how much Jesus loves them. Schaefer and I were talking earlier today, and you realize it's going to be years. It'll be years before they get stuff rebuilt. There will be businesses that won't even rebuild. They'll go out of business. Think of these small business owners that are already down there, and they've lost everything. They can't afford to pay their workers to not come to work, not like a large corporation can. I mean, I mean, just think, think how this just multiplies, how big this gets. Schaefer was telling me he went to New Orleans how many years after the... A year. How, a, year after, a year after Katrina, and it still looked devastated. And he was talking even big box retailers, Home Depots and stuff never even opened again. You see, there'll be people who will leave that area. What else are they going to do? He was telling me FEMA, FEMA can take a year. Is that right? FEMA can take a year to even make a settlement with you. What do you, what do, you do for that year? Where do you live? A lot of people were bashing people. You know, why didn't you leave? But have you ever thought about where would they go? Think of that. Where, where would they go? I mean, go evacuate to where? I mean, do you have family? Maybe family lives high and dry. Well, that's fine, but how many people don't have money? They can go check into a hotel. And if they could check into a hotel, would they find a room at the inn? They'd be like Jesus. I mean, no room at the inn. I mean, just think. See, we, we, our minds don't, you know, people want to bash everybody, but you weren't down there living it. Amen, but we can live it. We can live the love of God. We can help these people. And I've, I, I believe this, we, we've heard it for years, but I believe that what you're going to see in the heartland is that you're going to see the heartland begin to grow more and more as you see more and more natural disasters happen on the coast. I'm just saying, I believe that they're going to they're come, they're going to come things that c- cities won't even hardly begin to rebuild. Just devastation. It gets quiet when you talk like this. But you know what that means? It means people are going to move. Iowa. Is this heaven? No, it's Iowa. Remember that movie? <laughs> but it'll be like heaven. And we'll have heaven on earth. Amen. So I want us to, I want us to be the church. And, and, you know, you can still get involved. Here locally, we're supporting uh, Cadence Closet. But you, you do what God wants you to do. But I know you can go online. You can donate to them. Uh, you can take stuff out to their trailer. It's at uh, Candio Church out on where Heartland Vineyard used to be. They got a semi-trailer there, maybe more than one now. And they're looking. They're, they're not even looking so much for clothes. They're looking for cleaning supplies and water and water and food. And what is it? Canned food non-perishable stuff. And so, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's dire. But yet we got people that will go. And not just this, not just that organization. There's many, many wonderful organizations. I've, I really, my heart beats more with Christian organizations. You know, they're doing it because I believe that, that uh, they're sharing the gospel with the people too. Giving them good news, giving them hope. I mean, I just, you know, we can sit here, and I just can't imagine how hopeless that would feel. Hopeless. Everything gone. People got out with a garbage bag with whatever. And they got out, and they're going to go back to total destruction. Homes being bulldozed. So, let's do this before we go. Many of you probably don't know this, but Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, has made a proclamation for Sunday, 
September 3rd, which is today, to be a national day of prayer. Now, whether you believe with him, b believe in his politics or not, I think it's significant when any president will come and proclaim a national day of prayer. And I think it would be good as a church that we pray. And he the governor of Texas also proclaimed for the state of Texas a national day of prayer. And I think, uh, could it be, I'm just going to say, could it be that this is the scratching of a great awakening? Could it be? Could it be that things like this is causes us to, you know the same, some people don't look up until they're on their back. Could this, could this be? I mean, I don't believe God did it, but I believe God can make lemonade out of lemons. Amen. And could this, could this be when you have our, the, the president of our nation standing forth and saying, let's pray. We need to pray. We need to pray for Texas. We need to pray for Louisiana. We need to pray for the first responders. We need to pray for the victims. People have lost loved ones. Uh, we need to pray for the, the, the provision to get to the people, the help to get to the people. Uh, Hi, it's Miss Mary. I want to invite you to Accelerate Kids. While they are having main service at Accelerate 17, we're going to have an action-packed weekend here. I've got an amazing crew that's going to be teaching our kids how to run their race and find their destiny in God. We've got crafts. We've got games. We've got object lessons. We've got a whole great lineup this week. So I'm excited to see you. Bring all your kids, bring your family, and we'll see you there. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. If today's broadcast was a blessing to you, we would certainly love to hear from you at Waterloo Worship Center. You can email us at info at waterlooworshipcenter.com. Also, I would ask that you would prayerfully consider supporting KFXB TV Christian Television Network. You can simply go to kfxbtv.net and you can give right online there, or you could send your seed via mail at the address that is on the screen below. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you again. that is impossible for God. No, I'm considering he's the one who has given me his word. He's the one who's given me his promises. He's the one that has to bring it to pass.